My fellow students of the sweet science, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman. Uh, I'm a producer and editor here in the Author Events office, and as the undercard to tonight's main event, it's my pleasure to be here to introduce our author. Mark Cram Jr. won the 2013 Penn ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing for Like Any Normal Day, the tragic story of two brothers bonded uh, but separated by a devastating sports injury. A former sports reporter for the Philadelphia Daily News and Philadelphia Magazine and for publications in Detroit and Baltimore, he was honored by the Society of Professional Journalists with the 2011 Sigma Delta Chi Award for Feature Writing. He is also the author of Eddie and the Gun Girl, the true story of the 1949 shooting of Philly's all-star first baseman, Eddie Waitkus, by a deranged female fan. And he was the editor of Great Men Die Twice, a selection of articles by his father, the legendary Sports Illustrated writer named appropriately Mark Cram Sr. Mr. Cram's latest book is called Smoke and Joe, The Life of Joe Frazier, who, though born in Beaufort, South Carolina, lived the great majority of his life right here in Philadelphia, exploring the pugilistic and personal life of one of boxing's most misunderstood figures. This all access biography traces a life far more complex than his at times vicious rivalry with Muhammad Ali would suggest and tells a story of a life that was, in, that was indicative of a larger story about race, class, and celebrity in America. Tonight, Mr. Cram will be in conversation with veteran Philadelphia broadcaster Steve Ross, a current co-host of Remember When on CBS Radio slash WPHT. This Philly native has worked in radio as a producer, promotions director, and on-air personality at far too many area stations to name in a si single evening. And I was told he was named recently to the Broadcast Pioneers Hall of Fame. Uh, so let's get to it. In the immortal words of that great boxing ref, Judge Mills Lane, Let's get it on. And welcome Mark Cram Jr. and Steve Ross to the Free Library. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So nice of you all to be here. Um, it is my extreme pleasure uh, this evening at the Free Library of Philadelphia, in case anybody didn't know where you were. What a beautiful architecture this place is, is it not? Um, it's a real pleasure. I am pleased and proud as punch to engage in conversation with Mark Cram Jr., who has just written an amazing book about a Philadelphia icon called Smoke and Joe, The Life of Joe Frazier. And it's pretty exciting. Welcome, Mark. Thanks so much, Steve. I, it's really a delight to be here. I think of where I was uh, last year this time, uh, which was sweating out the last three chapters. Uh, really under the gun to finish it. And, uh, you know, a year later, here we are, and the book is born. I feel like I almost want to uh, uh, feed it and burp it. You know, it's, <laughs> it's really, it's true. It is your baby. And uh, Joe is a, uh, really, I'm so, so thrilled to have had a chance and opportunity to, uh, to do his story, which I think uh, is a bit overdue, actually, given his, this, his career and, uh, the large life that he had. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. you know. I guess the obvious question is, why do a book on Joe Frazier? Well, like everybody else, I, I really admired him. Uh, you know, I was said on the radio this morning that, you know, when you think about where he started in life, uh, amid the uh, malnutrition and disease and poverty of Buford, South Carolina, which was one of really one of the worst uh, most deprived areas in the country at that time. It was almost like a, someone that was standing at the bottom of a well, looking up at the night sky at the furthest star. It had to be, it, the journey was kind of, it had to be uh, not just improbable, but impossible. I mean, I know a lot of fighters have come from, from poor situations and worked their way up and, and found fame. Uh, but they are the exceptions, not the rule. And Joe, uh, uh, I, there's a lot to admire about how he made something of himself out of, out of the background that he came from. Interesting. I guess it should be mentioned that you're a legacy. <laughs> I mean that your dad, you followed your dad into the sports writing field. I did, yeah. And your dad was with the Baltimore Sun in the early 60s. Right. And then he went, moved on to become the lead boxing writer for 
the Sports Illustrated, mm. uh, and he covered all three of the Fraser Alley fights. He did, and you know, he, uh, he was a masterful writer, uh, really a poet. Uh, someone once called him the poet of the dark nights of sports. And I think it's probably quite accurate. You know, he, um, he, was, not a, he, he was not a traditional journalist, which is sort of uh, heavily uh, uh, engaged with interviewing. I mean, he was an impressionistic. I think of a painter who wrote impressionistically about things, and he had a command of the language. Uh, he was beautifully, I mean, he was really deeply read man. Uh, and it, uh, he was, uh, a, like Joe, he was sort of one off. I mean, uh, so I did follow in his career and uh, follow him in, in the sports writing and to his chagrin, actually, mm -hmm. he didn't really, you know. Didn't but encourage he, he didn't discourage me either, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, he knew that it was a, a, you know, kind of a tough, lonely profession in a lot of ways. And is that tough to do, is follow your, in your dad's footsteps? Um, was it, um, he also wrote a book called The Ghost of Manila, right. which debunked a lot of the positive aspects of Muhammad right. Ali. You're right. Was that something that, that drove you to do your book about Joe Frazier? Well, no, he was, um, well, it, <laughs> he had the same name, you know, yeah. I mean, that made it hard. Yeah. I mean, I, technically I'm not a junior. Uh, I was born in 1956. My mom named me Mark, and my dad was named George. George Melvin at the time, and three years later he took on Mark when he became a writer, so I had to switch it around, so it's really weird. Freud would have a, a, a field day with it. What is your name, yeah, anyway? I thought it was Mark Cram Jr., I don't Jose know. Jose Jimenez. I mean, <laughs> Hello? I, I mean, I don't know. I'll tell you what, though. He, he, uh, he I mean, he distinguished the name, and uh, he was a, uh, really, uh, I learned so much from from just picking up things, you know, uh, mm. and so, but as far as doing Frasier, I, I wanted to shy away from it. Uh, in fact, an editor in New York wanted me to do the book in 2008, and I said, ah, it's dad's turf, you know, I, Joe was still alive, and, and I was doing something else at the time, and I just sort of passed on it, but like... What sort of pushed you yeah, into doing the book? What? Well, it was an interesting thing, you know, um, I, I was, I had a... Um, I was looking for a project, it was about December 2015. One I was working on, I'd put a lot of effort and sweat into it, it just fell apart at the 11th hour. It's a, it just sort of fell apart. <laughs> and, and I said, well, what am I gonna do now? And I thought about Joe, and it was the oddest thing. I got flooded with chills. And it was almost like this cosmic traffic light was turning red to green. I know it sounds a little bit odd, but I look for those kind of things to sort of point me in the right direction as far as what I should be doing. It was a sign, right? What? I was sort of like a, kind of like a sign in a way, just sort of, and I said, yeah, Joe, you know, that makes sense, and well, I'd have to, you know, I'd have to get, uh, you know, I talked to Joe's daughter, Weta, which we had a conversation. She's been amazing uh, in, in supporting this project. Uh, as was uh, Denise Menz, who's Joe's longtime companion, mm -hmm. and many of other Joe's uh, family. Uh, Joe, Jun Joe Jr. is here, I think, tonight. Okay. I mean, the, uh, not everyone helped or cooperated or wanted to or chose to, but uh, you don't get everyone on your wish list. Right. Right? You have a wish list, and you, don't, you, you get what you need in this profession. What's interesting to me is that there have been a lot of books done about the... Ali Frazier, mostly leaning toward Ali. Right. He was the showman. He was the, you know, right. vociferous one. But your book really delves into almost every crevice of what happened to Joe from the Jim Crow era that he grew up in Buford. Right. All the way through and really gave you a lot of insight. Not so much in the ring, which you got a lot of that too, but gave you a sense of who Joe Frazier really was. Well, for, for this book to succeed, the aim was to uncouple him from Ali. Uh, now, that's impossible, right? I mean, their lives were so intertwined. Right. But to look, uh, for, for the, to look through the lens, Joe's lens through the story, uh, not through Ali's lens, and, and to sort of 
you know, tell George, Joe's story from beginning in. It hadn't been done. Dad did Ghost of Manila, but it was kind of an essayistic approach to the su subject. Uh, there's maybe a bit uh, given Dad's personality, trickly, uh, prickly personality. Mm -hmm. There was maybe a little bit more anger in there than 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 you might have wanted. Uh, although I love the book, I think it was a great piece of writing. Uh, so there was a lot of things that sort of uh, you know. Uh, sort of welcomed the idea of doing Joe as a story. I mean, let's think about it for a second. Philadelphia really, have they, has it produced a, uh, an athlete as internationally renowned as Joe? I, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I can't, none that comes to mind. Unless you count Rocky Balboa, you know what oh, I mean? Right. <laughs> yeah, the, the real stuff. Hey, the yo, real Mark, stuff. yo. The real stuff. No, no, I, there's not. And, and just to touch on that for a brief moment is that the idea that Sylvester Stallone came up with, the, the, what gave him the drive right. to make the Rocky movies, was seeing uh, Chuck Wepner, the Bayonne bleeder, against Ali in a fight, and he lasted the 15 rounds, and that was the impetus to, gave him to, to make Rocky. But when you really think about it, the Rocky character was patterned after Joe Frazier. Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. He borrowed a lot from Joe. He worked in the uh, slaughterhouse, worked right? Worked in the slaughterhouse. The slaughterhouse, you know, in, on film it looks like kind of a glamorous place, a slaughterhouse. <laughs> all this, all this wonderful meat. You want to pull, you want to pull up a table and you know order some wine, right? I mean, <laughs> but actually they're really filthy, oh dangerous, my God. terrible places. I mean, and think Joe going in a cold, uh, and going there. I mean, going there every day. I mean. Uh, did Joe punch the meat or no? Uh, I don't know. We did, did Joe punch the meat? I think he did. <laughs> <laughs> you tenderize her, right? Yeah, something like that, yeah. yeah. Do you remember the first time you saw Joe fight? I do. Uh, I was um, about 17. Um, my dad was writing for Sports Illustrated at the time, and he brought me to New York as kind of an end of school year, a little trip. Uh, um, he was living much of the time in New York at the time, and we were in Baltimore, um, and he, uh, you know, got me a ticket to the Frazier uh, Quarry fight, the second Frazier Quarry fight, and I was supposed to have Telly Savalas' seat, I'm told, <laughs> and of course then Telly showed up with a date, so I got bounced back to the cheap seats, and, uh, but it was really a, a thrill. I was sitting by myself and, you know, Madison Square Garden, and, and Joe Lewis is the referee, and Joe Frazier is, is tearing Jerry Quarry apart. And I knew all these guys because I was watching every Saturday, these guys would be on television. Yeah. Jerry Quarry from Bellflower, California. You know, I you mean, knew where they were all, from too, all right. these guys were familiar to me and I was so, so thrilled to see it. And, and, and the next day I went and joined dad at his office at the SI where he wrote his story for the magazine. All this is amazingly uh, uh, formative uh, for someone that age. You know? you know what's funny you mentioned about t like TV and the infancy of television, boxing was a big part of their programming. Oh sure. Yeah. I mean I remember that it was like you had the Wednesday night fights right. and it might have been Don Dunphy yeah. did the play-by-play -play, who's mentioned frequently in the book. Right. Uh, and then there was the, the Friday night fights. Friday night fights, yeah. It was, they have almost every night there was some sort, was of, some sort back of back in the 50s. Right. And Joe used to, they didn't have a TV set but when they they would go to neighbors' houses and, houses and watch the fights on these little small black and whites, snowy screens, and you know, uh, Joe had that. Um, uh, so he was connected to to boxing even then. So he was poor in Buford. Yeah. And he was also somewhat overweight as well, right? Well, by the time he had gotten to Philadelphia, uh, he uh, he'd come down from New York. And uh, he was about 30 pounds overweight, and he couldn't fit into any of his clothes. And uh, I guess he had gotten into some trouble in New York with a friend and involving some, you know, uh, 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 car theft and what have you. Just sort of stuff that, you know, seemed to be, he seemed to be heading in the wrong direction. Right. So his family sent him down to live in Philly. And his um, uh, sister, who I was fortunate enough to interview uh, for the book, Maisie, mm -hmm. um, uh, she sat him down and said, look, if you get in trouble down here, there's nothing I can do for you. Why don't you go over to the PAL and, you know, get to know the police, get to know the cops, 
Uh, and so he did. He, you know, he wanted to do good. He wasn't like he didn't want to do good. Mm -hmm. So he went over there and, you know, he worked off those 20 pounds and, or 30 pounds and, and he got in shape. And it, it was clear that he had a big engine inside of him, that right. he was not just a kid that was going to show up and then disappear. <clears throat> and he met with the Yank Durham. But <clears throat> and there was a cop named Duke, Duke Dugent who ran the gym, and <clears throat> it was extraordinarily extraordinary how men like that could, particularly uh, Duke Dugent. I mean, they put their lives into to keeping these kids, giving them a place to go. We could use that today. Right. We really could. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know in Baltimore they're talking about <clears throat> setting up boxing rings for the kids to work out <clears throat> some of their aggression. I think you should go further than that. You know, these, these pals and these places where these kids could go and, and like Joe told me the last interview I had, they said the kids need <clears throat> to be shown that somebody cares about them. I mean, that's a simple element, kind of a simple answer to a complex problem, don't you think? I think. Also, I read in the <clears throat> book that was interesting, speaking to the, the pal uh, and how helpful it is, George Foreman went to, not a pal, but a place like that in Houston. I think you touched uh, on your a book. Lot of, lot of, a lot of guys did. I mean, Work out the aggression and hit the heavy bag. and. Sure. I mean, it's a great confidence builder, uh, fighting, boxing, being able to defend yourself. I mean, uh, and, and the interesting thing is there's a great fraternity outside the ring. These guys tear themselves apart, especially in these Philadelphia gyms where they used to have these gym wars. Right. But there's a fraternity of, of fighters outside the ring. That's what people don't understand. There's kind of a brotherhood. And when Ali used to pull that stuff with Joe, Joe couldn't figure it out because that's not how fighters are outside right. the ring. They right. treat each other with a lot of respect. How much of what went on with um, Ali was showmanship and how much do you think was real? Well, he was a, he was a genius at, at, uh, at self-promotion and no promoting doubt. his fights. Uh, Bobby, and nobody had ever seen anybody Bobby, like him before, right? Yeah, Bobby Goodman, the famous publisher, a, publi a publicist told me a funny story about it. They were down in Houston. I forget the fight. That Ali was fighting somebody in Houston. And the tickets were just, they're going nowhere. Nobody was buying any tickets. And Ali was all, Goodman told me, he said, Ali was always coming into his room, his motel room. I got this idea. I got that idea. So he comes in one day and he says, I got it, Bobby. He said, we're going to pretend I got kidnapped. We're going to take me up to a cabin. <laughs> we're going to take me up to a cabin for three days. And they're going to say, where's Ali? Where's a Fight's off. You know, create this hysteria. <laughs> and then, we're, then I'm going to show up and then we'll get all the headlines and people go, oh, we can't do that, champ. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing. How much was real? He had an imagination that was unparalleled when it came to promoting himself. Now, the issue is with, with, with the champ, mm -hmm. he upped the ante when it came to Joe. He, it was psychological warfare uh, to, a lot of, to, to a large extent. Uh, Joe was a proud man. He didn't understand why Ali had to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, in the beginning, they were, um, I, I like to say that his relationship with, with Ali waxed and waned, his feelings about him. You know, he could get, uh, he understood that Ali played a, a key part in his future as an earner. However, Ali would do things. He moved to Philadelphia right. in, in, I think, 1970. They both lived here at they, the same time. Yeah, yeah, he moved to West Philly and then right. over to Cherry Hill. And he was always showing up pestering Joe. Right. I mean, think of it. I mean, your, your, your rival moves into your hometown, into your backyard, and he's showing up wherever you are pestering you. Well, one time down, in, down at the uh, Academy of Music, Joe Hans Sr. told me the story. Joe was with, uh, with Clover Light. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, he, Joe's there for a gig one Sunday morning with his, with his band. He's at the trunk of his car. You know, he's, he's getting his equipment out, his, his musical instruments. And all of a sudden, around the corner comes Ali. <laughs> Joe Frazier! Joe Frazier! Joe! And he's got, he's got 50 people following him. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And Joe was furious. Yeah. He's, uh, Les Pellerman, who was one of his guys, he said sweat bullets were, he was sweating bullets. Right. And he reaches for a tire iron. And he's going to, he, he said, I'm going to end this right now. Oh. And, and Johan says, if, you know, if he hadn't stopped him, he would've that would've, there would have been no fight of the century. It would have been settled right there on the street. Unbelievable. So he, uh, <clears throat> so that, he pushed Joe to an extreme, but Joe was, 
I doubt very seriously if he'd, if he'd uh, hit Ali upside the head with a tire iron, but he was angry, right? you know? And, uh, and then, it, you know, as time passed, the ante, you know, it got real ugly. Gorilla, Uncle yeah. Tom. You know, there's a story in the book from, that's drawn from a New, New York piece by a writer by Nick, named Nick Cohen, who's up at Ali's camp before the Manila fight. And it was, I thought it was really revealing. Um, Ali comes out after a workout, and um, he comes out after a workout, and he starts talking to the fans, He's, you know, around, gathered around, you, uh, kind of suburban housewives and, <laughs> and guys, you know, with beer bellies and what have you, and, <clears throat> and they're there to see the show. Mm -hmm. So Ali sort of, I am the greatest. You're looking at the eighth wonder of the world. You're looking at, and they're just sitting there. Wasn't getting it done. He wasn't getting it done. And then he upped the ante. The gorilla. And all of a sudden, they start getting into it. This swelling, raw energy kind of starts to build. And Ali just sort of goes from there. And that's what he did. He understood where the crowd was and how he could get them going. He could work them. And, you know, and Joe was the butt of that. And, I mean, he was saying things at that at Deer Lake at, Deer Lake, at right. the training facility with Nick Cohen, that he was said that one of the things he yelled out after Gorilla was he said, you want to you sell your face to the National the Wildlife, Wildlife Foundation? Oh, yeah. He, and then he said to him, he, Joe Frazier should pay, he should pay mirrors, mirrors pay him not to look in them. Mirrors pay, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he just said things that you would, uh, you know, just, just, just terrible things. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, Cohen did that article based on all that, and the title of it was Ali Racist. Uh, you know, and uh, he, for, from his reporting, uh, you know, <laughs> it was a compelling case, yeah. what he was saying there that I mean, day. You get the sense when you read the book that Joe just, like you said, could not understand what Ali was doing. Why all the mouth? Why, Why did it have to be so nasty? I mean, we do our, stu we do our stuff in the ring, right. the squared circle and whatever. And I think as you keep reading and as the book goes on, I got the sense that Joe grasped what was going on a lot with Ali, the showman part, and he looked at him to say, you know what, this guy's got a big mouth, but he's making us lots of money. Well, I think he certainly recognized that, but he didn't seem to think that we, we needed to go there, do right. that. I mean, the, we, the, the tickets would be sold. But perhaps Joe is miscalculating exactly the, the initial appeal of the the fights without Ali, Al Ali's, uh, you know, I wonder. Ali uh, looked at this whole thing globally. Joe looked at it as a fight, right. but it was much more than just a fight. Yeah. And, and, and Joe, uh, uh, I think he came around to the idea that, you know, that there was sort of a method to this madness, but it certainly wasn't a, a comfortable thing for him. But they had each other. They were both great. No, they were and great. They, and they had each other to bring out the greatness in each other. And you know what? Not only were they both great, they were both good guys. Yeah. That shouldn't be overlooked. I think that you, we don't want to cast Ali as this, I mean, the villain. Ali had his, had, his, had his issues, there's no question. But I think fundamentally, from what I know about him, I think he was a real decent guy. And, uh, uh, you know, so he was almost, he was almost schizophrenic in the way that he, uh, he sort of went about things. Yeah, well, you can't get inside of his head. But the thing is, because Ali and Frazier brought out each other's greatness, uh, a lot of boxers didn't have that element in their careers. Lennox Lewis was one. Mm. Uh, Larry Holmes was another. Oh, yeah. Where they just didn't have anybody to step in the ring with them to test them and bring out their greatness. Well, my old colleague, uh, Stan Hockman, great writer, uh, famously said that Ali um, and Frazier brought out the, wor uh, the best of each other inside the ring and the worst of each other outside of the ring. And I think that uh, that's really said. I want to make a decide is that, you know, one of the delights of doing this book was going back and reading the Daily News and the choir and the bulletin and the writers that were going back then. It's just fabulous writing. That's just uh, uh, Sandy Grady, uh, he talks about uh, Oscar Bonavina's style, and he describes it as, as Bonavina's style is like a guy trying to push a car out of a snowbank. Who writes that? 
I mean, what, what a, I no, mean, you're all, right. we're all arms and those, and, uh, and uh, Tom Cushman was another writer that was really a beautiful writer. All these guys. Larry Merchant. They, yeah, Larry yeah. Merchant. They were all bringing their A game to this story for years. And uh, I often wonder, 25 years from now, if somebody sits down and says, I'm going to do the definitive Bryce Harper book biography. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're gonna, he's going to be, look, no, and he's going to, they're going to go look around and they're not going to find anything that's really a, of any kind of, a, but these guys, these writers in this town, these guys were treasures and they really left behind a, 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 a basically a, 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 just a, a huge body of work that tells us what life was like then. Yeah, and, and in reading the book, they're peppered all throughout the book. Yeah, right. And I would keep reading them, and they were like, they were just, they were amazing pieces Sa of yeah. gems. Sandy, Sandy <laughs> Grady, Sandy Grady uh, said um, when Joe fought uh, Doug Jones, and he, <laughs> uh, uh, he hit Joe. Jones was kind of uh, aging at the time, and uh, Joe was on the rise, and uh, he, Sandy Grady said, uh, he said he hit him, and he and Jones froze on the top rope uh, like he froze on the top rope like a med meditative martini drinker at the bar. <laughs> I mean, who writes that? And there's such there, there's such gems. Oh, and yeah. you realize, and I think baby boomers in particular will really get into that part of the book because there's so many of these great lines from these scribes. There were treasures. These guys actually sold newspapers. Oh. I mean, the days oh. they wrote columns, they sold, they had more circulation. They, they were big deals. Oh, big deals. gosh, yes. And really good writers. Oh, my God. And it was just, that was a great thing about, yeah. uh, one of the many great things about the book. Um, you mentioned Cloverlay before. Right. Let me just regress a second. Because sure. that whole thing, when it happened, excuse me, microphone, when that whole thing happened, it was like they were offering shares to the public. And well, they weren't too expensive, as I recall. Well, no, they weren't. Uh, the, uh, the initial group was uh, 40 businessmen who together, all together, chipped in 20 grand. But even more important than that, they sort of uh, took care of Joe in, in ways that, uh, you know, they saw that his taxes were paid. Uh, they took a lot of care of a lot of the secretarial work. They also uh, wanted to make it strictly a Pennsylvania thing. You could only invest in Joe if you were from Pennsylvania. Right. In fact, uh, uh, George Romney, Mitt's father, would call Joe Hand all the time and say, how's Joe doing? He loved Joe. Right. He said, how's Joe doing? You sure you can't sell me a share? <laughs> Couldn't do it. It was a it Pennsylvania was strictly thing. a Pennsylvania thing. And uh, so they took after him. And, they, uh, and, and another thing should be said that Yank Durham and Eddie Futch managed Joe beautifully. They didn't overexpose him. They, they, they got the right fights for him. Uh, and you got to give Yank Durham credit for bringing in Eddie Futch uh, from, the, from the West Coast. They hadn't known each other. Uh, but Yank uh, wanted the best for Joe, and he got him the best. And Yank died at 52. I was stunned when I yeah, read that. Yeah, yeah. It's a baby. True. Yeah, yeah. And then he said to Eddie Futch, uh, you know, uh, not long before he died, he said, I want you to take care of my boy. And uh, one of the real kind of points I make in the book is after the, the third Manila, in the Manila fight, uh, when Eddie stopped it in, in uh, the 15th round, uh, Joe was really upset. You know, his moment had been taken from him. And of course, he was in terrible shape. Could barely see, uh, he right? He couldn't yeah. see at all. Yeah. And he was sort of feeling his way around the ring. And he was just going on raw courage. And you know, uh, you know, there was thought that Ali himself was going to quit if Joe hadn't have quit. I, uh, you know, some real fine writers have uh, put that argument forth. I don't particularly believe it. I think that while Ali was really dead on his feet, I think Angelo Dundee, his trainer, would have pushed him out. Like he did in the Liston like fight. Like he did in the Liston yeah. fight. I th but, but Joe, you know, he wanted to continue. And Eddie said no, and that was, that was it. And he was out of there. And Jetty was, uh, Joe was really angry at him, but, but Eddie, you know, he, you know, he never second guessed himself. And he said, well, you know, he, he was true to his word to Yanks, you know. Took care of his boy. Took care of his boy. Yeah, that was something. Um, 
They fought three times in four and a half years. Yeah. 41 rounds. 41 rounds. Three not classics. In, not, in, not including the, the brawl they had on Cosell set. Oh, when they were. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Which is, a, there's another story that goes with that, because Eddie Futch was reluctant to, this is before the second fight when they had this interview, uh, you know, uh, at the uh, studio, television studio. Eddie Futch says, all right, well, we'll do, this, we'll do the interview, Howard, but we want you to sit between uh, Ali and Frazier. Oh, sure. Oh, sure, Eddie. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. They come out, and there it is. Cosell's on the end. Joe is sitting here, and <laughs> Ali's sitting there. Right? So anyway, it, what happens, it, they, 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 words get exchanged. Joe's hot under the collar. They get up, and uh, they start <laughs> wrestling, and Bobby Goodman's yelling, no, Joe, no, Joe. <laughs> he, he, he said, let go of his ankle. You're going to blow the fight. <laughs> I mean, they were yeah. really going at it. And, and Futch, was, Futch was furious at, uh, at, at Cosell. He said, you're an unprincipled man. Yeah. And he was, you know, Eddie Futch was, I have the highest regard for, yeah. for, for that man, yes. I, but he I, just did not. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we were asking about the No, no. The, and the other thing is, I'll just throw this in because... It shows you like how quickly life goes by. I was talking to a millennial person not too long ago. <laughs> I was trying to anyway. And, and, I, and I, mentioned, um, I mentioned Howard Cosell. And they went, who? And I said, hello <laughs> again, speaking. everyone. Howard Cosell, speaking of sports. That one? Blank look. Howard spinning in his grave. I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, but I, you can't imagine that somebody doesn't know who Howard Cosell is. He was so giant. But Time. then again, it's the same people that were another conversation that I had about WIP. And I mentioned to a millennial that, you know, gee, I remember when WIP, had, they played music and they had Ken Garland, Tom oh, Moran, geez. Tom LeMayne, <laughs> blah, 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 all the, you know, Nat Wright, and looked at me quizzically and said, you mean WIP used to play music? <laughs> and it's like, wow, talk about getting old. Life on the back nine is well, tough. Well, time me, marches on, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Unbelievable. To what, to what extent do you think that uh, ultimately Joe and Ali worked out their issues? Well, I, I wondered about that. You know, one of the, the kind of the questions I had for uh, everybody I interviewed that knew them well was that did they... Uh, did Joe bury his grievances at any point, or did he carry them to his grave? And uh, some people that knew Joe, writers, uh, uh, writers I respect and admire, said that absolutely Joe uh, carried it to his grave. Uh, you can't do or say to a man what Ali said to Joe and not carry it with you to, to the bitter end. And now were there other people his family members mostly, the people that knew him from South Carolina, they just didn't buy that at all. They said that Joe didn't have any hate in his heart. And I wondered that, you know, and it wasn't until the very end of my research that I sort of really kind of uh, ground down and got an answer to my question. And I really do, without spoiling the ending, because it really yeah. is kind of an ending that you want to read without having it being spoiled, um, I, uh, I really was heartened by how things ended up between them. Did he lend Ali money? That the, the rumor was that he lent Ali money, or gave him, gave him love because gave you know, him love. That's right. what, the, what you always said about love. giving him love. Yeah. yeah the, well, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I think that story's true. Uh, you know, Ali was really down on his luck and down on, down uh, when he was in exile. He was struggling. I mean, there, I mean, there were, <laughs> there's a there's a scene in the book where he's, you know, the two were talking about Ali's talking about. Um, you know, coming and being Joe's sparring partner for two hundred dollars, and you know, but Joe isn't sure because Ali wants to be the main event. You know, he's kind of double crossing him because he wants to be clear that Joe's the main event. But Ali says no, and they go back and forth. It's really like, uh, you know, it's like a comedy act in a way. Yeah. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, Ali was, uh, you know, he was cash poor, and uh, his future was, you know, uh, grim. Uh, uh, you know, there they've been talk about them fighting before Ali went off uh, to, on his exile, uh, which would I think ha would have had uh, catastrophic uh, uh, consequences for Joe. I think mm -hmm. Ali would have would have handled him at that time. 
But by the time they got in the ring in March 8th, 71, Joe had been galvanized into a real, uh, a real uh, unstoppable force, I think, mm -hmm. at that time. It's not just an Ali Frazier thing, because part of that trifecta was George Foreman. Right. He touched both of these fighters and whatever. Joe had a lot of trouble with George. Well, physically, I mean, George was much bigger. Uh, and um, Could negate that know, pressurized sty style. But it's or, all styles. Boxing's yeah. all styles. I mean, uh, as George said, uh, uh, he and Ali would fight 100 times, and they would be 50-50. Yeah. And, and, and uh, it's like... You know, they they paired up differently. They matched they matched matched up differently. Um, but uh, George, uh, you know, Joe went to Jamaica to uh, to uh, defend his title uh, against George. And uh, Joe was not he didn't have his head in the game. You know, it's the kind of thing where you reach that peak in your career, and you're at that peak, and then you come down, and you start taking shortcuts. Yeah. And you know Eddie Futch was very worried about uh, about uh, Joe going into that fight. You know, in fact, Joe was sparring with Kenny Norton at the time, and Norton was just on the rise. He was just months away from giving Ali that broken jaw and right. sort of rising into some prominence of his own. Mm -hmm. And Eddie asked him. He said, "You know, what am I seeing out there? Joe doesn't look like himself." And he says, "He says I don't know what it is." Uh, Norton. He's, well, Futch uh, just said, told uh, Kenny Norton. He said, "You're all on vacation." He didn't want him sparring with Joe anymore to sort of undermine his confidence even more. But Joe was going out to sing with his group. He was going to parties. Uh, there, there was a big, it was a big family event down there. I mean, Joe was like cutting, cutting his uh, uh, pants off and jumping in the pool. It was, it was, it was, it was, a, it, it was uh, he was ripe for the picking at that time, I think. And the other thing that has to be mentioned is uh, Joe, of course, has gone, Joe and Ali have both gone to heaven. Yes. And George Foreman is still on TV selling grills <laughs> and, and talking about inventors, get your stuff discovered. Right. The irony right. of that, right? Well, it's particularly at the time, because Joe or George, at the time he was fighting Joe and Ali, it was kind of a sullen guy. Yeah. It's not the same George Foreman that we're seeing on television now. That's true. You know, I mean, and also he's a little paranoid. I mean, George always thought he was being poisoned. Somebody was poisoning his food and everything. But by the time he came back, mm -hmm. we saw a whole different... Oh, totally you know. different. Uh, interesting about Joe Frazier and his, how George Foreman perceived him. And George Foreman said that Joe Frazier had a look that scared him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He, it's did, like, he did say that. Yeah. And, and which, you know, and you would think nobody would get scared Right. Right. Of, um, of, you know, but it's, you know, he is. Um, um, but, but George was very confident going into that, going into that fight in Jamaica. You know, he said he's going to go bop, bop, bop and pick him off like birds on a fence. And a know? lot of people forget that when Ali fought Foreman after having decimated Joe right. Frazier twice. Right. It was at the Rumble in the Jungle, right? Right, right, right. Everybody. He was a decided underdog, Ali. Well, yeah, I mean, Foreman was... Uh, and then the rope dope came out there? The rope dope uh, George punched himself out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, again, it's Styles, right? And, uh, and I think Ali had Foreman uh, pretty well pegged, uh, you know, how he was going to handle him. He had these, you know, long, you know, sweeping uh, punches, and I think Ali sort of, uh, he lured him into that rope dope and... And, and Ali in the gym, I mean, he used to take ter terrific punishment in the gym. That's one of the things people kind of overlook. He would lay back on the ropes and uh, uh, just let his sparring partners wail away at him, you mm. know. Uh, just, it was incredible in a way, um, the damage he took in, the, in, in his sparring sessions. I'd be remiss if we didn't touch on the knockouts. Oh. Now, now Joe, of course, he put as much passion into his singing career and money yeah. that he did in the boxing, right? Oh, well, he, he loved singing. It was, yeah. you know, it was really a creative outlet for him. And I think it tells you a lot about Joe that he, that he, that he did that. Uh, and Red, know, Smith he, did mention, oh, Red Smith did mention. Oh, jeez. Red Smith did mention when he was asked to describe what the knockouts sounded like, how Joe sounded singing, he said it sounded like kitchenware falling down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Rather harsh, I'd say, yeah, but, I would uh, a little bit, yeah. and kind of 
but never let anything get in the way of a good line. That's what they always said. Um, yeah. Well, you know, as a kid, you know, growing up in Buford, the music was really kind of an integral part of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the whole culture. I mean, Joe's mother, Dolly, had a beautiful singing voice. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm told that Joe and, his, uh, and some others would, they would, you know, sing a cappella under the trees down there. And, and of course, it was a, a major thing at the church, you know, the, you know, the music and song was a very much a part of it. And Joe carried that north with him. And when he got, when he got into, uh, 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 you know, to Philadelphia and made some money, uh, it also fit with his, his, his love for the nightlife. Joe was restless. He mm -hmm. was not a guy that sat at home. He was going to get out there and, and, and mix it up out in, the, out in the world. Right. And singing was a great conduit to, for that. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Cram Jr. The book is called Smoking Joe, The Life of Joe Frazier. Thank you. I enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. I was wondering if Joe Frazier ever commented on the second um, Ali Liston fight, which is highly controversial. Not that I'm aware of. I, I, don't, I don't have anything for you on that, I'm afraid. Did I hear that um, uh, Joe was in the hospital for about a week after the first um, um, Ali fight, the right. one that he won? Right, yeah, he was. Uh, and. Um, there were a lot of rumors going around. I mean, you know, the old Tyron story. <laughs> I mean, Ali was really beaten up bad by Joe, but Joe was, Joe was uh, uh, in bad shape himself after that fight. I mean, that fight was just a, a tough, tough uh, uh, fight. Uh, there was rumors around that Joe had actually died. In fact, it, they, got back to, they got back to Ali. Uh, Gene Kilroy picked up the phone and and uh, a writer told him, uh, Gene, Joe, uh, Joe's passed away. And Ali said, if that's true, I'll never fight again. Yeah. Uh, but Joe was in the hospital uh, for tests and uh, for various other things. Of course, Ali made, made hay with that uh, during, his, <laughs> during his wrestling match at the, at the, with the Cosell show. But yeah, I mean, he, he, was, uh, he, he was down for a while. His eyes were bad, right? I mean, he had really serious problems with his eyes, which made you wonder how he got licensed to drive and oh, to fight. Oh, uh, yeah, he had, according to his, uh, his uh, eye doctor, uh, he had uh, congenital um, cataracts, cataracts yeah. in one eye. And, uh, you know, the, and all the, the trauma it takes. The trauma it takes sort of worsens it. Of course, he got that problem corrected as the technology proved later in his life. Uh, but, you know, for the uh, uh, second Foreman fight, uh, I'm told that he uh, actually fought with uh, lenses, contact really? lenses. Well, he would train with these lenses, and, you know, they were so expensive at the time, <laughs> they kept popping out. They'd buy boxes and boxes of these things. Wow. And Joe, was, Joe wanted to keep it, keep it going. Yeah, too. He understand that his limitations okay. were. Mr. Cram, I, I really enjoyed your book. Uh, it, it, you've done what uh, a good biography should do. You gave a real flavor of the tenor of the times, you know, uh, particularly Philadelphia in the 60s and the 70s. And I'm so glad that you paid homage and quoted liberally from the sports writers at the time. Mm. Because not only did you have Ali and Frazier, who brought out the best in each other, they were, they were great fighters, you had great heavyweights at the time, and you had great sports writers. Oh. You, you, you blended them all together, and it really comes across. Thank it, you. It, it's good. Uh, one thing that can not concern me, but I've never understood about, about Joe Frazier, is that, uh, speaking of the, the, the uh, time in Philadelphia, Frank Rizzo was considered by many, uh, I'm among them, uh, was thought to be a racist bully. Mm. Joe Frazier and, and uh, him were friends. Now, right. I, I've never understood this. Do you get any sense from his family how this relationship well, came Well, yeah, I think I can sort of get at that a bit. Um, you know, Joe, as I mentioned earlier, uh, had come up through the PAL, and the cops had been good to him. Uh, they had treated him well, and I think Joe's nature was, if you're good to me, I'll be good to you. I think it was a very simple kind of equation. Now, with Rizzo, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, a bad idea to have Rizzo as a friend in this town um, at that time. Uh, now some of the people that worked with Joe or worked for Joe 
said they didn't like it, but they lived with it. You know, Joe was the boss. There was a sense that, and my theory was that, you know, uh, becoming a Confederate with Rizzo was kind of built a firewall, you know, for Joe in town. Now, maybe that's overstated a bit, but the thing is that even uh, Joe's mother, Dolly, told a, told a pastor down in Buf Buford, or maybe the pastor, they're surmising this, he said, God put that white man on the earth to take care of my boy. Uh, and that's what it was about. And also, Joe didn't see race that way. You know, Dolly did not raise Joe to see that race that way. You never, use, you never heard Joe use the N-word or, or use any kind of racial jargon that way. I think it just came down to, and I think he was kind of apolitical in the sense that, uh, of course, he was on the side of many Republicans. The Republicans lined up to, uh, uh, to sort of, uh, you know, Nixon brought him in, was the champion. Once he won the championship, it was like it was raining politicians. And Nixon brought him down and, uh, you know, Nixon and the Watergate tapes, the, the gift that keeps giving, the, the Watergate tapes. Yeah, there is Nixon talking to Colson in the office saying how Joe can help, help them with the black vote. So, you know, I guess from hindsight, you can sort of make some judgments about Joe's choices in that regard. Uh, at the time, I think it probably looked a little different to him, uh, but it's a fair question. My son boxed in Upper Darby, and one night Joe Frazier was in the audience. My son, after his bout, his hand still wrapped, went into the men's room. As he's standing at the urinal, Joe comes in and stands <laughs> next to him. He then goes, you know, you should use your height more. <laughs> and Sean looks at him. and. <laughs> There in the men's room, they started sparring. Joe <laughs> throwing punches and missing Sean by about an inch. Wow. And Sean backing up. A guy opens the door, looks in, closes the door, and I don't know where the hell he went. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah. That really is good. That's you know, Joe's character. Well, it is Joe's character. I mean, he was there to, uh, he was, he understood what it meant to be the champ. And the champ in, is kind of a special thing in our culture. Uh, at least in those days it was. Uh, Joe, uh, he was a man of the people. Uh, you didn't have to set up an appointment to see him. All you had to do was go down to North Broad Street and knock on his door, and he's there. And he took uh, an interest in you that was genuine. How, how novel. I mean, you look at athletes today, and, and they're sort of standoffish, and they're surrounded by PR people, and you know they're inaccessible in a lot of ways. Uh, but Joe was out there, and Ali was out there too. I mean, I have countless stories I couldn't even get in the book. Kids walking up to Joe's house, knocking on the door, and him inviting him in. <laughs> Ali too, over in Cherry Hill, same thing. They were just regular guys. One is, what kind of father was Joe Frazier, and how would he have done against somebody like Mike Tyson? Well, let me take the, the uh, second one first. I think he would have wiped the floor with Tyson. Ooh. I really do. Yeah. Uh, I, no, I, I, I really think Joe would have handled Tyson. Uh, uh, I guess some could disagree with that. It's just my personal view. As a father, uh, I think he uh, loved his children. Uh, I think he uh, provided for them uh, and met their needs. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I wouldn't want to go much beyond that, uh, make a judgment or anything about that. His life is a very complicated and uh, oftentimes muddy thing. And uh, uh, I think he's, uh, I think he did well by his children. Uh, thank you for your book. Uh, was he with Cloverlay when he went to the 64 Olympics? No, that had not been put together yet. Uh, he uh, uh, basically had to scrimp and save and get the money together to, to sort of, I mean, he was working at the slaughterhouse. They didn't have much money. His wife, Florence, was uh, a, a, ch a checker at, uh, at Sears. Uh, so they were really up against it financially, but you know, um, it was a gamble worth taking. Cloverlake came later. 
It was kind of interesting, just want to add quickly. George Foreman won the, the heavyweight title at the 68 Olympics. And that was the same Olympics that Tommy Smith and John Carlos right. put the black power thing right, up yeah, there, the fist right. up. And George, if you recall, had that little American flag that he walked around the ring with. Right, right, right. Well, they were complicated times. Yeah, they, they were. They were, definitely. Yeah. Thank you very much. I had uh, a question and, and also a comment. The question is, is it, an, is it true that Ali, of, at some point late in his life, apologized to Joe Frazier for all the insults? Well, he would do that through third parties, tell Joe, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Joe wasn't really having anything of it. He wanted Ali to come to him man to man. And as you see in the book, uh, at the end of the book, you see that kind of unfold. Um, but I don't, want to, I don't want to say too much about it because it would take away the effect of reading it. But just say this, that it really ended in a place that we would all hope that these things would end. So my comment for what it's worth, uh, <clears throat> I knew Joe Frazier late in life. I was one of his doctors. Oh. And uh, he said in no uncertain terms that he was very, still very bitter about ah. what uh, Ali said about him and to him, and uh, he never forgave him. Well, uh, well, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your experience could be different, but that's not mine. I heard you mention Styles. Styles, yeah. Right, and that was me. Famous by Georgia Penn, another former oh, sure. fighter here and trainer. Yeah. In, out of Philadelphia. Yeah, I didn't, um, but, but didn't mean to overlook him. He was he was really important. Yeah, because he did help Joe Frazier out. So. Oh, sure. He was a great fighter too. And um, why? I mean, what do you say? Or why isn't? Uh, Champion Joe Frazier's uh, Bob and Weave style mentioned more. I'm sorry? Why I'm... isn't, why, w why would you say Joe Frazier's Bob and Weave style right. uh, adopted from Eddie Futch in general yes. isn't spoken of more? Well, I, I spoke... mean, because he, he, he really uh, personified that style. Right, and I speak about it in the book you know, uh, uh, I addressed that in the book, I, the, how that came about, and and uh, and also Georgie Benton's role in it, and uh, so that is addressed in the book. I mean, it's oh, pardon me, I, I hadn't read the book yet. Right, so I will right. get the book. Well, we didn't mention it here, but <laughs> it's there. In, it's certainly there in the book. Cool. My other question is uh, regarding the elimination tournament. Right. And you may have, sp I don't know if what you said, it spoke on in the book about that. Uh, but my understanding is that Joe Frazier protested that tournament um, on account of Ali being stripped of his uh, title. I don't think it was quite that. I think that, uh, I mean, it was a brilliant move by Yank Durham to, uh, uh, to, to stay out of the tournament, I think. Uh, Joe was highly rated. He really had nothing to gain by beating guys in a kind of a tournament that way. So by holding him out, he just protected his interests. You know, let these other guys fight it out and then fight the winner, which he, which he did. Um, uh, so I think it, it had less to do with a protest than it did with just strategy as far as building Joe's career. Turned out to be a stroke of genius, too, didn't I it? I think it was, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what, was your favorite, what was your favorite part about the book? What was your favorite moment? Um, In the book? Yeah. Well, the ending is my favorite moment, but um, my second favorite moment is how Joe used to stop on the side of the road and help people fix tires. I, I still can't get over that. The heavyweight champ of the world, he, you're driving down the road and he sees a guy on the side of the road, a stranger, and he, and he, and he stops and gets out and fixes the tire and goes, he's like he's, like he's uh, AAA, you know? I mean, he's, <laughs> he's, he's like he's, uh, uh, but uh, so that really goes to his character and uh, uh, it's not a big thing, but it's kind of one of my favorite things. But it is a big thing. 
tells you a lot about the, the man. Right, yeah. That he would, you know, the, the, the man he had seen with at legs, and they, he wound up taking him home and oh, he peeled right. off $100 bills to him. Well, and, a couple of hundred or yeah, whatever he gave him. Whatever he did, yeah. Whatever he gave him, he called it his love, and he had his money in his, his sock, a roll in his yeah. sock, and he, 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 he's driving down Broad Street with uh, two young fighters in the back, uh, his son Hector and uh, a fighter named Kevin Dublin, and mm -hmm. they're going to Atlantic City, and he comes across this legless man in a wheelchair uh, uh, with a can of kerosene in his lap, and he's struggling to get across the street. And it's a cold December day, holiday lights on Broad Street, just kind of a cold day. And, and, and Joe pulls the car over and takes the guy, puts him in the passenger seat. <laughs> Dublin and Hector give the take the kerosene can, uh, can and, the, and the chair and put it in the trunk. And they drive to his house, which is this narrow street in North Philly, and to this house that looks like it might be occupied by squatters. It's got like these um, um, uh, quilts on the, in, in right, the window right. to kind of keep the heat in and the, and the cold out. And they go in this sort of kind of dingy room and uh, the wife comes out of the kitchen and she sees Joe Frazier standing there in his, in his fur coat. Okay, and she says, what in the world is this? <laughs> Joe Frazier? And, and, you know, they got the, the guy sitting there. He said, why do you do this? He says to Joe, he said, because, you, you know, you look like you could use some help. They are. He said, you said, you, you could, Joe says, you could use some love. He said, I got all the love I, I need, you know, you're doing this for me. And Joe peeled out some money, and, and, uh, and then they went on their way, the, the, the Joe and, his, and the two young men. And for, like, uh, 40 minutes, they don't say anything. Joe doesn't say anything. He usually plays Bobby Womack, and he's, right. you know, on, in the car. But it's, like, silent. And then he goes, finally, he says, you know, you see, that was a man. You know, telling the to two guys that. That was a man doing for his family, going out and doing. He was trying to make a, an object lesson for these guys. This is what a man does. This is who a man is. Right. So uh, I really thought that that was really uh, told me volumes about who Joe Frazier was. And also, in the, la the last part is he really beat the hell out of Joe Bugner and <laughs> Jerry Quarry, and he went to their dressing rooms after the fight to oh. see how they were doing, you know, to say, hey, good, good fight and whatever. He, he was yeah. that, he was, had yeah. a lot of good stuff going on. Well, you know, he, he, it was a fight. It was mm -hmm. a, uh, they were getting paid. He didn't want to hurt these guys. Right. I mean, uh, the Bugner fight, if you watch it, uh, uh, one of the latter rounds, Joe kind of pulls back. Right. You never saw him do that before. Right. I don't think you want to hurt anybody. Exactly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attendance, for your questions. And ladies and gentlemen, Mark Cram, Jr.